as humans, we often tend to place a greater trust on the things that we can see with our own eyes and touch with our own hands. This was one of the reasons the Israelites held on to, held, held on to the Old Covenant, or they held it in such a high regard. Not only did God initiate his plan to redeem his people through the Old Covenant, but following it also provided the people the chance to get their hands dirty, to participate, and to see its inner workings with their own eyes. For example, we, and this is, again, stuff that we covered already, every year on the Day of Atonement, every household, every family had to slaughter their own animal. By doing this, it gave the family, everyone from the kids to the older, um, older family members, the opportunity to participate in something visible and tangible, the shedding of blood for sin. Christ, however, entered a heavenly temple to offer sacrifice, his sacrifice for sin. Now, the Bible is clear that the Christian believer, the born-again Christian, is a citizen of two worlds, the earthly and the heavenly. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 22, or chapter 22, verse 21, that as believers, we must render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Thus, Christians must learn how to walk by faith in a world that is governed by sight. Like Moses, they must see the invisible if they're going to overcome the pull of the world. See, a practical man will say, seeing is believing. But the man of faith replies, believing is seeing. Well, this principle of faith must apply to our relationships, or our relationship to the heavenly sanctuary. We've never seen this sanctuary, yet we believe what the Bible tells us about it. We realize that God isn't worshipped today in temples made with hands, nor is there a special place on earth where God dwells. Sure, we may call the church, a local church building, we can call even this church here a house of God where we worship and we learn about God's word, but we know that God doesn't live here. So what the author will begin to show us here in chapter 9 is how Jesus' work in the heavenly temple is fundamentally superior to the work done by priests in the earthly one. You will see through, throughout this chapter, in this chapter, how our Lord, Lord's spiritual work is far greater, is a far greater value than the work accomplished by, earthly, by the earthly tabernacle because it fully and finally satisfies, satisfies God's wrath. So before we get it, start reading the first section of chapter 9, let's pray and ask the Lord to, to bless us this morning. Lord, we are so thankful again that we're here. Lord, we're thankful. We're humbled that we're able to sit here and hear your word, Lord, and not be, and just to want to know more, and want to know you more personally, want to, we want to hear from you, Lord. And, and for us, that's what life is all about. That's everything about life just to hear from you, to know you, to grow, to, to, to grow more, be more intimate, Lord, with you, and grow more in, in knowledge of you, your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that you will now um, plant the, the knowledge, some wisdom into our hearts and minds, Lord. And we just 
not be distracted by the worries and problems of our lives, Lord, and just right now, hear from you, Lord. That's what we want. So bless this morning, Lord. Bless your word. I mean, bless us with your word right now, Lord. And bless those watching and listening to you, Lord. May lives be changed. May more people come to know your son, Jesus Christ. So we pray all this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. All right, Hebrews chapter 9. The word of God says in verse 1, Now the first covenant also had regulations for ministry and an earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was set up, and in the first room, which is called the holy place, where the lampstand, the table, and the, pres uh, and the presentation loaves, behind the second curtain was a tent called the most holy place, it had the gold altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered with gold on all sides in which, in which was a gold jar containing the, ma the manna, Aaron's staff that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. The cherubim of glory were above the Ark, overshadowing the mercy seat. It is not possible to speak about these things in detail right now. With these things prepared like this, the priests enter the first room repeatedly, performing their ministry. But the high priest alone enters the second room. And he does that only once a year and never without blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people, for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was making it clear that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed while the first tabernacle was still standing. This is a symbol for the present time during which, get, which gifts and sacrifices were offered that cannot perfect the worshiper's conscience. They are physical regulations and only deal with food, drink, and various washings imposed until the time of the new order. In these first 10 verses, the author turns his attention to the imperfections of the earthly tabernacle. He begins to remove the hope that Israel puts in their participation of the sacrifices and shows them how they should think about the old covenant practices in light of Christ. But he begins by first reminding them, first reminding his readers that the, uh, that the regulations and practices in the tabernacle were ordained of God. Now it's important before I move forward to keep in mind that if there were, if there was any inferiority in the tabernacle service, it wasn't because God had made a mistake or he had messed up or, you know, he didn't, you know give the instructions properly. See, while the old covenant was in force, the ministry of the priest was ordained of God and perfectly proper. So what was it then that made the tabernacle, that earthly first tabernacle, tabernacle inferior? Well, in these verses, there are five answers to this question. Now, the first thing he mentions in verse 1 that made uh, the earthly tabernacle inferior was that it was an earthly sanctuary. This means it was made by man and pitched up by man. The Jewish people generously brought their gifts to Moses, and from these material, materials, the tabernacle was constructed. Then in Exodus chapter 35 and 36, God gave spiritual wisdom and skill to Bazalel and Oholiab to do the intricate work of making the various parts of the tabernacle and its furnishings. After the construction was completed, the sanctuary was put in place and dedicated to God. Now, even though the glory of God moved into the sanctuary 
it was still an earthly building constructed by humans out of earthly materials. So being an earthly building, it had several weaknesses. For one thing, it needed a certain amount of repair. Also, it was limited geographically. It was pitched in one place and could not be in another place. It had to be dismantled and in various parts carried from place to place. Furthermore, it belonged to the nation of Israel and not to the entire world, to all the other nations that were around at that time. Second thing that, that uh, made this tabernacle inferior, see that in verses 2 to 5. We're told it was a type of something greater. The writer listed various parts and furnishings of the tabernacle because each of these carried a spiritual meaning. meaning. Now, time won't allow me to, to get into every single article in that tabernacle. You know, again, just a few things are mentioned in this passage. And even then, you know, there's more to it. And, you know, I've seen several YouTube videos that, you know, describe every aspect of that tabernacle, even down to its measurements and how it was purposeful. But again, each of these things carried a spiritual meaning. As verse, later on, verse 29 will say, they were patterns of things in heaven, in, in the heavens. Now, the phrases, the first in verse 2, and the second in verse 7, refer to the first and second divisions of the tabernacle. The first was called the holy place, and the second was the holy of holies. Each of these divisions had its own furnishings. And each piece of furniture had its own special meaning. And, you know, here again we're men are mentioned a few. In the holy place stood, stood the seven-branched lampstand. Now, since there were no windows in the tabernacle, this lampstand provided the necessary light for the priest, priest's ministry in the holy place. As spiritually speaking, the nation was, of Israel was supposed to be the light of the nations. Well, now Jesus Christ is the light of the world. And believers are to shine as lights in the world. There was also a table in the holy place with 12 loaves of bread in it, on it. It was called the table of the showbread. Each Sabbath, the priests would remove the old loaves and put fresh loaves on the table and the old loaves would be eaten. These loaves were called the, the bread of the presence, and the table was called the table of the presence. Only the priests could eat this bread, and they, required, and, and they were required to eat it in the sanctuary. What this did is it was supposed to be a reminder to the 12 tribes of God, 12 tribes of Israel, of God's presence that sustained them. And it also speaks to us today of Jesus Christ, the bread of life given to the entire world. The golden altar that stood in the holy place just in front of the, the veil that divided the two parts of the tabernacle. The golden altar didn't stand in the holy of holies, but the ministry pertained to the holy of holies. In what way, you may be asking? On the annual Day of Atonement, the high priest used coals from uh, the, the, this altar to burn incense before the mercy seat that was within the veil. Each morning and evening, a priest burned incense on this altar. David suggests, King David suggests, that it's a picture of prayer Ascending to God in Psalm 141, verse 2. And this, too, can be a reminder that Jesus Christ intercedes for us. Now, moving on to the second division of the whole is, was the Holy of Holies. 
and contained only the Ark of the Covenant, a wooden chest three feet nine inches long, two feet three inches wide, and two feet three inches high. On top of this chest was a beautiful mercy seat made of gold with a cherub or with angel's wings at each, at each end. This was the throne of God in the tabernacle. So on the Day of Atonement, the blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat to cover the tables uh, the, 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 on this mercy seat to cover the tables of law that were in the ark. God didn't look at the broken law. He saw the blood. Christ, our Lord and Savior, is our mercy seat. But his blood doesn't just cover sin. It takes it all away. No doubt many spiritual truths are wrapped in these pieces of furniture. And all of them are of value. But the most important truth is this, my friends. All of this was symbolism and not the spiritual reality. It was this fact that made the tabernacle of the old covenant inferior. And verses 6 and 7, we're told the third aspect of the tabernacle that made it inferior. It was inaccessible to the people. Now, we mustn't get into the idea that the Jews assembled in the tabernacle for worship. The priests and the Levites were permitted into the tabernacle area, but not the people from the other tribes. Furthermore, through the priest, though the priest administered in the holy place day after day, only the high priest entered the holy of holies. And only once a year. When he did, he had to offer sacrifice for his own sins as well as for the sins of the people. Now in contrast, the heavenly tabernacle is open to all people. To all the people of God. And at all times. Fourthly, verse 8, verse eight tells us. That it was temporary. The fact that verse 6 says that the outer court was standing was proof that God's work of salvation for man wasn't done. The outer court stood between the people and the Holy of Holies. As long as the priests were ministering in the holy, of, uh, the holy place, the way had not yet been opened into the presence of God. But guess what? When Jesus died on the cross... The end of Matthew uh, verse, uh, chapter 27 tells us that the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom and the way was opened into the Holy of Holies. There was no longer any more need for either the holy place or the Holy of Holies. It was unnecessary now. It was obsolete. For now, believing sinners... Sinners like you and me could come directly into the presence of God. And fifthly, verses 9 through 10 tells us that it was inferior because its, its ministry was external, not internal. The sacrifices offered and the blood applied to the mercy seat could never change the heart or the conscience of a worshiper. And, and all the ceremonies associated with the tabernacle had to do with ceremonial purity, not moral purity. There were car carnal ordinances that pertain to the outer man, but that cannot change the inner man. So you see... Again, this, this, what the writer here of Hebrews is, is trying to show the original reader and us. It was trying to show the reader that it, wasn't, it was weak. It wasn't perfect. It was just a shadow of the perfect thing, the perfect tabernacle. 
And he will get into that now in this next section that we're about to read of Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11. But Christ has appeared as high priest of the good things that have come in the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. He entered the most holy place once for all time, not by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of of a young cow sprinkling those who are defiled sanctify for the purity, purification of the flesh, how much more with the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse our conscience from dead works so that we can serve the living God. Therefore, he is our mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called might receive the promise of eternal, of the inter- eternal inheritance because a death has taken place for redemption from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Where a will exists, the death of the one who made it must be established for a will is valid only when people die, since, is it, since it is never in effect while the one who, is, who made it is living. That is why even the first covenant was inaugurated with blood. For when every command had been proclaimed by Moses to all the people, according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats, along with water, scarlet wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled the scroll itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that God has ordained for you. In the same way, he sprinkled the tabernacle and all the articles of worship with blood. According to the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Therefore, It was necessary for the copies of the things in the heavens to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves to be purified with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with hands, only a model of the true one, but into heaven itself, so that he might now appear in the presence of God for us. He did not do this to offer himself many times as the high priest enters a sanctuary yearly with the blood of another. Otherwise, he would have to suffer many times since the foundation of the world. But now he has appeared one time at the end of the ages for the removal of sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is it. And just as it is appointed for people to die once, and after this judgment, so also Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Now, in the previous section, we were given the five deficiencies of that old covenant sanctuary. Well, here now, in this section, we're given the five superiorities of the new covenant sanctuary. A sanctuary that is far superior in every way. First, we're told in verse 11 that it's far superior because it is heavenly. The writer has emphasized this fact before because he has wanted his, he wanted his readers to focus their attention on the things of heaven and not on the things of <coughs> earth. Some things on earth, including the beautiful Jewish temple, would soon be destroyed, but the heavenly realities would endure forever. 
The old covenant tabernacle was made by man, was made by the hands of man. The new covenant sanctuary wasn't. It wasn't made by human hands. The tabernacle of Moses was made with materials that belonged to this creation. The heavenly tabernacle needed no such materials since the heavenly tabernacle doesn't belong to this creation. It's free from the ravages of time. It doesn't waste away. It doesn't fade away. It doesn't break down. It doesn't rip, tear. It's eternal. <coughs> the good things to come had already, be, had already arrived. And that was foreshadowed in the tabernacle was now reality because Christ, because of Christ's <coughs> priestly ministry in heaven. The tabernacle was patterned after the sanctuary in heaven. But today, we no longer need the pattern. Again, we have an eternal reality. Second, it's superior in that its ministry is effective to deal with sin. That's what verses 12 through 15 tell us. In these verses, we have a series of contrasts that show, again, the superiority of the heavenly ministry. One that was mentioned is animal sacrifices there in verse 12. The writer discusses the inferiority of animal sacrifices, or he will do this in, in Hebrews chapter 10 the next, in the next chapter. But here, he begins to lay the foundation. We need no proof that the blood of Jesus is far more superior to that of animal sacrifices. How can the blood of animals ever solve the problem of humans' sins? Jesus Christ became a man that he might be able to die for people's sins. His death was voluntary. It's doubtful that any Old Testament sacrifice volunteered for the job. I don't think there was any animal that said, yeah, take me. I'll do it. You can sacrifice me. No. But Jesus did. An animal's blood was carried by the high priest into the Holy of Holies. But Jesus Christ presented himself in the presence of God as the final and complete sacrifice for sins. Of course, the animal sacrifices were repeated while Jesus Christ offered himself once. Finally, no animal sacrifices ever purchased eternal, eternal redemption. Their blood could only cover sin until the time when Christ's blood would take away sin. Do you hear that? Let me, let me repeat that. Their, those animals, their blood could only cover sin until the time when Christ's blood would take away sin. We have an eternal redemption. It isn't conditioned on our merit or good works. It's secured once and for all by the finished work of Jesus Christ. Ceremonial cleansing and conscience cleansing is, is mentioned in verses 13 and 14. The old covenant rituals couldn't change a person's heart. Now this isn't to say that a worshiper didn't have a spiritual experience of his heart um, if his heart trusted God. But it does mean that the emphasis was on the external ceremonial cleansing. So long a worshiper obeyed the prescribed regulations, he was declared clean. It was purifying of the flesh, but not the cleansing of the conscience. We learned in, back in Hebrews chapter 8 that the ministry of the new covenant is internal. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. The writer of Hebrews wrote in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10. 
this work is done by the Holy Spirit of God. But the Spirit cannot dwell within us if Jesus had not paid for our sins. Cleansing our conscience cannot be done by some external ceremony. It demands internal power. Because Jesus Christ is without spot or blemish, he is able to offer the perfect, the perfect sacrifice. Temporary blessings is also mentioned. Temporary blessings and eternal blessings are also mentioned in verse 15. The blessings of the old covenant depended on the obedience of God's people. If they obeyed God, he blessed them. But if they disobeyed, he withheld his blessing. Not only were the blessings temporary, but they were primarily temporal. Rain, bumper crops, protection from enemies and sickness, so forth and so on. Israel's Canaan inheritance involved material blessings. Our eternal inheritance, though, is primarily spiritual in nature. Now, we must note that the emphasis is on eternal. Eternal redemption there in verse 12 and eternal inheritance in verse 15. So this means that a believer can have confidence because all that he has in Christ is eternal. So verse 15 makes it clear that there is, there was no final and complete redemption under that old covenant. Those transgressions were covered by the blood of the many sacrifices, but not cleansed until the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. Since Christ has accomplished an eternal redemption, we are able to share in an eternal, eternal inheritance. So these three contrasts, church, we can easily see that the ministry of Christ is effective to deal with our sins. His finished work on, the, on earth and his unfinished work of intercession in heaven are sufficient and efficient. Now third, a superior, it's a superior covenant because it's a ministry based on costly sacrifice. The word covenant not only means an agreement, but also me, it also carries the idea of a last will and testament. If a, mind, if a man writes his will, that will is, isn't enforced until he dies. It was necessary for Jesus Christ to die so that the terms of the new covenant might be enforced. Even the old covenant was established on the basis of blood. Verses 19 through 21 is taken from Exodus chapter 24, verses 3 to 8. The account of the ratifying of the old covenant by Moses and the people of Israel. The book of the law was sprinkled with blood, and so were the people and the tabernacle and its furnishings. It just must have been a solemn occasion to, to be a part of that, to, to witness that firsthand. So not only was blood used in the beginning of the ministry of the Old Covenant, but it was used in the regular administration of the tabernacle service. Under the Old Covenant, people and objects were purified, were purified by blood, water, or fire. This was, of course, ceremonial purification. It meant that the persons and objects were now acceptable to God. Through Jesus Christ, we who are sinners can enter into the Holy of Holies in the heavenly sanctuary. Physically, of course, yes, it's true, we're here on earth, but spiritually, we are communing with God in the heavenly Holy of Holies. In order for God to receive us into this heavenly fellowship, the blood of Jesus Christ had to be applied. So, we enter into God's presence by 
the blood of Jesus. Verse 24 tells us that the fourth way, the new sanctuary or the new tabernacle is superior. Its ministry represents fulfillment. The new covenant Christian has reality. We're not depending on a high priest (coughs) on earth who annually visits the Holy of Holies in a temporary sanctuary. We depend on the heavenly high priest who has entered once and for all into the eternal sanctuary. There, their church, he, he represents us before God and he always will. Now beware of trusting anything for your spiritual life that is made with human hands. It's not going to last. The tabernacle was replaced by Solomon's temple, and that temple was destroyed by the Babylonians. When the Jews returned to their land after the captivity, they rebuilt their temple. And King Herod, in later years, expanded and embellished it. But what happened later on in AD 70? The Romans destroyed that temple And ever since then, it's never been rebuilt. Furthermore, since the genealogical records have been lost or destroyed, the Jews aren't certain who can minister as priests. There's no way to know for sure who is allowed to, who comes from the tribe of, of Levi. These things that are made with hands, are perishable. But the things not made with hands are eternal. And so fifth, verses 25 to 38. Is that right? 25 or 28 or 38? 28, sorry. Says the heavenly sanctuary is superior. Why? Because its ministry is final and complete. In other words, there can be nothing incomplete or temporary about our Lord's ministry in heaven. Now, uh, I'm going to skip a big portion of, uh, of the, that little section. Because I want to right now, just with the time I have, focus on the last two verses. Verses 27 and 28. And there the author draws a comparison between the deaths of, the deaths of all people and the death of of Christ. It is appointed for people to die once. In other words, we all are going to die eventually. Eventually we're all going to die. That's a certain that's a certainty. Our physical bodies are going to die. But the second half of both verses contain an unexpected contrast. It is and after this judgment You would expect verse 28 to parallel Christ died once and he's coming back for judgment, which is true. But instead, the writer there says that Christ died for once, died once, but he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Now, I want to share with you, what I want to do is I want to share with you four important practical truths here. I'll try to go through these quickly. First of all, God has appointed death for all people. Enoch, Elijah, and those living when Christ returns are the exceptions. But apart from them, all must die by God's appointment, meaning there's a time and a place. In other words, death is not a natural process. Death is a reality because man sinned and God ordained that the penalty for sin is death. Also, the Bible teaches that God sovereignly appoints both our birthday and our death day. David proclaimed in Psalm 139, verse 16, in your book, 
were all the written days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. Death may seem accidental to us, but it's never accidental to God. No one lives a day. Let me repeat this. No one lives a day less or a day longer than God ordains. He knows the exact moment that you're going to die. The exact place, the exact time. No one lives a day less or a day longer than God ordains. This should give us great comfort when we lose someone that we love and care about. Especially if it's someone that's young. God has reasons and purposes that we don't know and we don't understand. But you can trust him. You can trust God. As Job said, when his ten children were killed in a sudden windstorm, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. This truth that God has ordained the day of death should also give us peace as we think about our own death. Now, while we shouldn't take reckless chances with our lives by doing stupid things, and while we should be sensible in regard to the things that we do with our lives, the fact is, the fact is that our lives are in God's hands. We, you, will die at his appointed time. Now, the second thing we can apply from these two verses is apart from Christ, people die and face judgment. Again, verse 27 says that people die once and after this comes judgment. This verse right here, clearly, it refutes reincarnation. People don't die and come back in another life or as someone or as something else. This verse also refutes the idea that people get a second chance to receive Christ after they die. My friends, death is final. One person, one commentator wrote, To refuse the cross as the instrument of salvation is to choose it as the instrument of judgment. This is why the Bible urgently warns us in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. Now is the day of salvation. Daily. Delay, I'm sorry, delay in trusting Christ could be eternally fatal. Believers in Christ, however, don't come into judgment, but are passed out of death and into life. Believers will appear before the judgment seat of Christ to be recompensed for the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10 through 15 tells us that our faithless evil deeds will be burned up as wood, hay, and stubble, whereas the gold, silver, and precious stones will be the basis for reward. Number three, Christ died once to bear sins, but is coming again to finalize our salvation. Verse 28 says that Christ was offered once to bear our sins. Again, let me tell you what this refutes. And I'm not trying to start any debate or argument here. And I respect our Catholic brothers and sisters. But this clearly refutes the Roman Catholic practice of the Mass where Christ is offered as a sacrifice repeatedly in the communion elements, which they believe becomes the actual body and blood of Christ. But do you know what? The average Catholic worshiper barely understands this. They don't, they don't understand. They just see the bread and the wine or, and they just take it, but they don't understand what it represents. They don't understand... At the instant they trust Christ, 
the instant they trust in Christ, all sufficient sacrifice, God forgives all their sins and it imputes the righteousness of Christ onto them, meaning that Christ's righteousness has now been transferred over to the believer. Christ's second coming will not be with reference to sin, since that was the issue, since that issue was completely resolved at his first coming. Rather, he will appear. This is the hope that we have. He will appear for salvation to those who are eagerly awaiting him. There are three tenses, three, three tenses to our salvation. We were saved in the past at the moment we trusted Christ. Presently, we are being saved as God works his holiness, as we are being sanctified into, as we are being sanctified, and as we, as he, God works his holiness into our daily lives. And in the future, when Christ comes, we shall be saved completely and finally. 1 John 3, 2 says, when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. It's a great promise. This is the promise that we have. And so number four, those whom Christ has saved eagerly await his coming. Again, the picture here behind this last phrase in verse 28 is of the Jewish believers on the Day of Atonement. And I spoke about this last time we were together. They were always anticipating that priest coming out of the Holy of Holies. Again, the minutes seemed like hours, and, and they were always wondering if he was going to come out. And finally, when he did, they rejoiced because he knew that God had accepted their offering and their sins were covered. Even so, our high priest has gone into the true Holy of Holies in heaven out of our sight. He took his own blood with him. And so now we eagerly wait to see him come again. Because then, and only then, or at that time, all of God's promises of salvation will finally be realized. So let me ask you, do you eagerly await the coming of our Lord? As Paul faced martyrdom, he wrote in 2 Timothy uh, verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 8, There is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not only me, but all those who have loved his appearing. So if, because of Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ is your Savior, you love His appearing, He's not going to pass judgment on you. But as, right, uh, but as righteous judge, He will award you the crown of righteousness. So now let me bring this all together. Let me sum up what, what, we've been, what we read here, what I've been saying. Here the writer in this chapter pointed out the obvious contrast between the Old Covenant ministry and the New Covenant ministry. The Old Covenant repeated sacrifice. The New Covenant only, had one sacri only has one sacrifice. The Old Covenant, the blood of others. The New Covenant, the blood of Jesus. The Old Covenant covering sin. The New Covenant putting away sin. The Old Covenant was for Israel only. The new covenant for all sinners. The old covenant left the holy of holies. The new covenant entered heaven and is still there. The old covenant came out to bless the people. The, old, the new covenant will come take his people to heaven. So in short, the work of Christ is a completed work. Final and eternal on the basis of his completed work. He is ministering now in heaven on our behalf, on the behalf of born-again believers. So after reading this chapter, the Hebrew Christians who had received this letter had to realize that there's no middle ground. 
they had to make a choice between the earthly and the heavenly, the temporary or the eternal, the incomplete or the complete. Why not return to the temple? But uh, why not return to the temple, but also practice the Christian life? Why not the best of both worlds? Because that would be compromising and refusing to go without the camp bearing his reproach. As verse, as we'll see in verse chapter 13, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 13. There is, my friends, no middle way. If you're a believer, your sanctuary is in heaven. Your father is in heaven and his savior is in heaven. Your citizenship is in heaven and your hope is in heaven. The true believer walks by faith, not by sight. No matter what may happen on earth, a believer can be confident because everything, everything is already settled in heaven. It's all been done. So now as I close here, as I, I now want to direct my attention to those watching and listening. I want you to know that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. And he wants to forgive you of your sins. And he wants to give you eternal life. All you got to do is accept it. All you've got to do is just say, yes, Lord. Admit that you're a sinner. Confess him. Believe that he died on the cross and he rose from the grave. And then now he's sitting at the right hand of God. Make him the Lord and Savior of your life. And he will change your life. The Holy Spirit will come and live within you and radically transform your heart. And that in turn will start changing your entire life. There's a home waiting for you, an eternal home waiting for you in heaven. But that isn't there. It's not available to those who are sinners who don't confess their sins. There's no reincarnation. There's no second chances. You can't receive Christ after you die. So today is the day. If you're ready to confess your sins to, to Jesus and become born again, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Wherever you're at, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head. Pray this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I ask for your forgiveness. I believe that you died for my sins and rose from the dead. So now I turn from my sins. I repent and, and I confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. So now I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born again life. In your name, amen. If you pray that, it's that simple. You don't have to do all kinds of works. You don't have to do all kinds of things to be saved. By faith, you've been saved, not by works. So if you prayed that and you are a born-again believer, I want to welcome you into the family of God. You're now my brother and sister in Christ. If I don't meet you now in this life, I will meet you in heaven. But I want you to tell us about it. I want you to reach out to us to Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel and, and maybe Facebook or, or YouTube or on our website. And let us know how we can continue to minister, how we can continue to serve you. Maybe we can help you out in your, in your next steps of your Christian walk. Or even if you're a longtime believer and you need prayer, you need, 
you need to want to rededicate your life, reach out to us and we can pray with you. But um, don't go another day because you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. I want to thank you for those watching and listening. I hope that the Lord continues to bless you, continues to envelop you with his love and mercy and grace. And you continue to be salt and light in your homes and your communities. I look forward to seeing you next week as we get into chapter 10 of Hebrews. But for now, be blessed. Have a great week. We love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope we were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.